This is the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast, hosted by David Charlton, and you're listening to this podcast to help you build your own mental toughness, or so that you can support other people or your clients better. Either way, you will learn more about developing this plastic personality trait that all but guarantees that you will perform better and lead a more prosperous life. Hi, welcome back to the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with your host, David Charlton. So, how are you? I sincerely hope that your new year was a great one. Now, to start the new year, we've got episode 151 here of the podcast. And like the previous episode, it is going to be a compilation episode of a very similar format. Though today, the focus is going to be on football and soccer. So every guest that has appeared on the show to date has either worked in football in some capacity, they've coached, they've played, they're a sports psychologist and have consulted in football, and they're going to go on and share their key take-home messages. I really do hope that you enjoy it and that you get some nice timely reminders to boost your motivation at the start of the year. Yeah, I'll definitely say. I mean, I think it is being incorporated now if I was looking at... um, I think I was looking through some of the framework for, you know, some FFA B license or something here in Australia. And there is a kind of a psychological part of it. Um, what I'd say, you know, for coaches is is get on board and do some sports site courses, you know, uh, just even whether it's online and through someone, you know, reputable who's been doing it for a long time. Um really get to understand you know the different parts of what players go through so you can see them on a human level and not just as objects playing the game and obviously in this past year or so there's um you know been so many things like the olympics where um you know uh, you know athletes have said no to performing because of mental health and you know, we're not just, you know, these little cogs in the wheel, like athletes, you know, to, to perform and entertain for everyone. There is an entertainment aspect, but when you take away the human aspect, you're turning athletes into robots and that's inhumane. And uh, I'm so glad so many players have stepped up. I don't think that would have been possible even four years ago for a couple of those athletes to have stepped up and and um, spoke about their their mental health, which is still such a, a stigma conversation, you know, uh, so unfortunately. So I'd probably say, you know, for coaches, um, really, like I would say get to know your players a little bit more, you know, see what they do, like what are they stoked on outside of football too, like take the time to do it. It, yes, it does take time and it does take a bit of energy, but it pays off to know your players. It pays off to understand if they have, if the, if your players or, or athletes have a part-time job or whether they have a sick parent and all those kind of things, like get to know them and actually be a human and empathize with them. Be performance-based, of course, and, and results-based. That's a, you know, coaching is a job and you want results to keep your job, but There has to be that human side of it that, um, you know, I think is more prevalent now. But, um, yeah, it's going to be a lot more important going forward for the mental health of players. And remember, players are humans. So, (laughs) and, you know, what you got to realize that as a coach, what you could be, how you could be affecting the player now, you've got to ask yourself, is it positively in a positive direction for their future or is it going to be negative and going to affect them negatively outside of their sport as well? Um, so you've got to be really self-aware and understanding of the words that are coming out of your mouth as well as, um, you know, the direction where you're taking an athlete. From a sports psychology perspective, number one is trust. Everything you do in your job must be built around maintaining and improving trust with players and staff. Never, ever do anything which threatens the trust. Number two would be timing because there are days when you can offer opinions and solutions and questions, but there's days when you simply have to withdraw at stage, as I call it. And the third one would be also always look after your own energy and health and well-being and all that goes with it, because this job is about giving and not taking, and it's never, ever, ever about you. It's about other people, and that in itself can be really tiring. So make sure that your own, even if you're 21 or 61, make sure that your own health is not compromised by the service you're trying to provide. 
the three kind of messages that I would start with, firstly, the, the three R's. So if you're a practitioner entering any environment, I'd look to build rapport. That would then elicit better working relationships on both a personal and professional level. And then I think that then develops a lot of respect. And I think anyone working within a football environment needs to respect what you're doing. Otherwise, they won't give you the opportunity to show your worth. So that's something that I would really take away as a first message. Um, I think gaining that level of contextual understanding and, and football knowledge it would be my second uh, kind of insight from, from my own personal experience of working in football. The benefits of understanding the language, the benefits of having input within certain aspects of a training session or match can really define whether that coach or whether the members of the multidisciplinary team think you know what you're talking about. So that's a, the second message. And, and, and lastly, I think for any practitioner, just really enjoy the moment that you're in because it's so easy to worry about what does the future hold for me as a sports psychology practitioner? Oh, what have I done all this work for in the past to be in this present moment? You, you, you do worry about that quite a lot, as a, especially as an early career practitioner. And I would say if you're working within a sport that you truly love and you're working as a psychologist, you're not defined by your wage packet. You're not defined by your title as a trainee. I think really just give it the, the best you can and, and that will then fuel and ignite more opportunities. And, and I think we're, we're very privileged to work as sports psychologists within sport. Um, it's a cutthroat business and it's very hard to get a role, but when you're in there, it's one of the most fulfilling things you can do. So um, that's the kind of three takeaways that I would give David. Mindfulness is an ongoing process. I like the high performance podcasts, by the way. So I'm going to take, I'm going to use one of the things that they always talk about on that um, empathy over opinion. Um, always try to place yourself in the other person's shoes and empathize rather than having an opinion because generally you will never understand what that, that person is feeling or what they've been through. Um, so just try to understand. That's a yeah, it's a big skill for a coach. That is rather than as you say, just making instant judgments, is actually asking some damn good questions to find out what's going on inside someone's head. Yeah, and that was only two, wasn't it? Yeah, it was. Number three, <laughs> number three encourage people to um, be more self-aware and build in character, because from that you'll f you'll have a lot less fear and doubt, and fear and doubt is the only thing that gets in the way. Of you moving forward the first one would be just on that point that talked about you know that that kind of potential tension between you know personalization of the psychology and, and regulation i think that's something to just kind of stay tuned on i think that's something that, that's going to be kind of more frequently talked about i think the other thing is i'd encourage again where, wherever wherever people can to, to try and make sure that you know you have kind of nuanced you know conversations about this and I've a lot of uh, most people that I speak to do and, and are really kind of educated but I, I just just think the more that you know we have people out there talking about this subject in in kind of the, the way that it deserves I think you know that's the way you change the kind of conversation as a whole and then yeah kind of thirdly I, I'd say you know from my side hope that there'll be more people kind of you know writing about this and I think the media kind of has something to to kind of to, as a journey to go on here as well in terms of how it talks about the issue i think it's starting but again i think it's um you know there are a few writers out there that, that are doing some fantastic work but um you know i think there's there's a lot more that could be done on on that front for me one of the you've got to you've got to learn to to look to stand up for yourself in the correct manner you know you can't just don't just don't accept things you know unless it's the uh, you know, be open and honest because coaches, I mean, it's, it's a big thing for me. I've, obviously, I'm going through it. Coaches are, you know, their doors are always open, you know, just to chat and then having the courage to go and chat. You know, often I think, you know, looking back on my time, I, like I said before, I just accepted things. I didn't really have the courage to go and talk to, to the manager. I didn't have the courage to go and talk to, um, to coaches or, or anybody. But having that courage, because, you know, it's, we're all you know, men at the end of the day who, you know, it, it's, it's this stigma that we have that, you know, we can't be open and honest. Well, if you're not open and honest first with yourself, but then with other people, then, you know, you're never going to get anywhere. Um, so for me, the, 
it's not so much having three it's just having one of that having that courage to just to talk just to to get things off your chest um because there is you know some unbelievable people in academies who are there to support you you know it might it might even be your teammates just go and talk to your teammates go and talk to your mom go and talk to your dad you know because if as soon as you start talking there will be people there to help you get through whatever you're facing um whether it be a professional problem or a personal problem you know they'll, they will help you and and that's a and it's a big thing that i i try to tell our guys out here in phoenix is that you know we are always here if it's 10 o'clock at night you want a phone call because something's going on with you and your missus or there's something playing just just pick up the phone and talk um and i think that's the my biggest you know my biggest advice to to people facing facing adversity i like it so basically we've got there the coaches doors always open have the courage to talk and then yeah talking is powerful it's it's really good ultimately and it can only help you yeah yeah i mean it's 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 a tough thing to do but if you do it, then you'll get further than, than holding everything in. Yeah, no, I completely agree. Uh, you'll, you'll feel better and coaches are going to know what's going on inside your head as well at the same time. So exactly, they're going to be able to help you. Exactly. And if they don't have the answers, then they can, you know, they can put you in touch. You know, I've, uh, you know, I've got a, a brilliant support network of, of contacts, you know, people like yourself and, uh, and, and other people, in, not, even, not just in the, in the football industry, but outside of it, where I'm like, if I don't have the answers, then I'll put you in touch with somebody who does. Um, and I think that's a great thing about having, um, you know, this, this contact base is that I don't know everything and I don't, you know, portray to know everything, but there, I'll, I'll know somebody that will be able to answer the question for you. Um, and it's given the guys this courage to, to go and talk to a stranger. And I think that was one of the biggest things for me was that, you know, I, I just went and talked to, to a psychologist who I didn't have a clue who he was. And it was great because he didn't know me. I didn't know him. And we could just have a sit and a chat. And, you know, I, we spent, I spent years talking to him. Right. The, the first thing I would probably say is that whilst it's well documented and commonly referred to as a team game, I would encourage individual motivation and to make sure that your personal development is at the forefront of your thoughts always and as much as every footballer wants to win each and every football match that they participate in there's absolutely nothing wrong with placing the utmost priority on your own performance and i say that because it's became a cliche in football to always refer to it being a team game and that the individual's performance doesn't matter or is secondary. And you will not last long in football if you think that all is well with the world as long as the team wins. So if people want to term that as selfish, then I certainly don't mind. But when you're young and you're aspiring, your dreams centre around you being a professional footballer not necessarily the team you're playing for being successful. So, you know, think of yourself, and that's not just in relation to what you do within the environs of professional football. It's about how you live your life. You know, don't people please. You know, if you're within a group of friends or acquaintances, they're asking you to do things at times that are incompatible with what the expectations would be of a young footballer, then be confident in saying no to this group of friends or this group of acquaintances because your mind and your body is your livelihood and your discipline is instrumental in how you're going to develop. And at times you have to have that courage and conviction to say no in certain situations. So, you know, be focused, be disciplined and think of what is always beneficial for your development. Yeah, I think... Never stop learning would be the key one. Um, you know, I am obsessed with learning. There is so much to learn in this world. Don't think you ever know it all because you're not going to. And I think the minute you do think you know it all, um, you're doomed really. So a key takeaway would be never stop learning. Learn as much as possible on the pitch, off the pitch, um, through films, through sessions, through people's conversations. I try and learn something from from anything really. Um so, yeah, that would be one key one, never stop learning. The second one would be to never stop believing in yourself, um, whether you work in football or you don't, you know, or involved in football or you're not. Never stop believing in yourself. Um, I think you've got to 
trust your own instincts and, and give it your everything really. So my second one would definitely be that believe in yourself and, and keep doing what, what you're doing really. And then the third one would be to maximize that potential. So every day, you know, am I doing something that's going to help me get better? Uh, what are the small gains that you could be doing to, to maximize everything you possibly can to be the best person and player you can be? Um, and whether that's sitting, writing in a journal, getting out on the pitch, practicing crosses, um, learning from people's conversations, learning from films that, you know, maximize your time, which we don't get a lot of, by the way, life goes very quick. Um, every minute counts. So maximize as much potential as, as possible, really. Gary talks a lot. Takeaway number one. Gary talk, Gary waffles. Takeaway two. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I think I think like for me, it would be it would be don't get constrained by by uh, frameworks. Like don't like read and educate and do courses, but don't copy and paste things into your environment. Like I think in essence. Sometimes we think that coaching is a is a pathway of steps. Coaching course, first job, win, second job, pro job, head coach, Mourinho. And I think instead it's it's like find out what you need to take and then find your personality in around that there. And then like talking about the psych, like use your personality alongside the psych to actually impact people. And the advice that I always then give young coaches is start where you are and make the environment better like build a reputation um as someone who's dependable who says what they're going to do and can actually coach like and i think the coaching is going to come back into vogue where it's going to be less talking and, and people that can connect it's going to be a people business again and i think we're maybe going away from it at the minute um it's just my opinion I would say the three key factors or the three key takeaways would be, one would be see everything as an opportunity to grow. I would say learning is the key factor to succeed in whatever uh, you want to succeed and whatever success means to you. And respect and love yourself um, because that is so important. I mean, you are within yourself 24 seven. Um, you know, no one else is going to care for you as much as you do. No one else is going to be with you 24-7. No one else is going to do it for you. And no one else should or could. And so you walk your way. Make sure that you, you know, while you walk it, you are content with yourself. First one would be be humble, which is something that I believe a lot of young footballers do get carried away with, with example sign your first professional contract because at at an age of like 17 18 or something you're probably going to get if you're getting a decent amount of money at that age you can easily go and spend it on nice cars and stuff but be humble just know remember where you came from and don't get carried away with stuff that you haven't made it when you get your scholarship or when you get your first contract you haven't made it like football's a very short career and people don't realize that so that would be my first point second one would be simply work hard and make sure you're doing something every single day to kind of progress each, each each kind of day and get to your end goal, whether that be playing the Premier League, play for your country, etc. Set your goals and just focus on that each day. Uh, and then third thing is probably don't take it for granted because a lot of lads, there was times where I kind of took it for granted, especially when I was injured and I was kind of thinking, oh, I'll be fine, I'll get back fit and... I'll sign a contract somewhere else and my football career will be absolutely fine. But it doesn't always work like that. I'm not saying that you're not going to make it as a pro. Like I would never tell anybody that. But be realistic and, and look down the line. And also think football's not forever. Football's a job up until, what, like early 30s, late 30s, if you're lucky. You've got to think long term. A fourth point, just enjoy, enjoy it as well. You're, you're fortunate enough to be a professional footballer or a footballer, or a scholarship footballer, so enjoy the experience. So I'll add an extra one in. I missed your question. <laughs> Never mind. Four, four <laughs> points. <laughs> no, that, but that, to be fair, that last one's a, a really good one because, yeah, quite it is quite easy to, to lose the enjoyment in, in what you're doing. Where you, I don't know, you work, you work so hard or you, you don't necessarily have great relationships with people in your club or something like that. Yeah, I'm not so sure about three. I mean, I'm hoping 
that within the, the, the discussion that we've had, there's takeaways in there. And I don't want to repeat myself in terms of some of those, but I'm hoping that within some of those, some of the discussion that we've had, there's some practical insights into how you might better support your child, how you might support coaches if you're a sports cycle or even just a general practitioner. Um, and hopefully what we might look at doing when we're looking at kids who are transitioning from one age group to another and how we might support that proactively rather than reactively. Because I think a lot of the time we'll go, oh, this person hasn't adjusted well enough. What can we do? Actually, let's look at that early do- early doors and go, well, what challenges might this person experience? Can we equip them with the necessary support and resources that they might need? Um, so I guess those are key takeaways. But for me, a key takeaway, and it's something that I always mention, is, is the idea of relationships for me being a sports psychologist and just in general you know humans have a have a need for 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 interpersonal relations they love they thrive on relationships um and nothing's bigger nothing's a bigger determinant of our well-being and 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 quality of experience in whatever we're doing and the, the connections that we have with the people around us so for me it's really important that the people that we're working with we we build those strong relationships with and the basis of that for me is about listening so for parents who are looking to support their child just provide that space and listen for me is the most important one because sometimes they just don't want an answer they just want to talk to someone about the troubles and challenges that they're having so be that space and, and 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 listen intently to what they've got to say and offer support and guidance if you deem it necessary um for me that's a massive one and i'm not going to give you free because i feel there's loads in there um and we could end up talking for ages but for me yeah, the importance of building relationships a massive takeaway for me in, in the work that we do within sport um with all the stakeholders that we're, we, we interact with Okay, so it sounds a little bit brutal, but the first one, um, find a way to stand out from the crowd, whether that's in training or in matches. You have to find a way to stand out from the crowd. So when you're playing under 15 games, under 16 games, whether it's by going around kicking people or whether it's by scoring goals or whether it's by crossing it in 20 times a match, you have to find a way within training and matches to stand out very quickly. The second thing would be you've got to learn very quickly. We're all given nowadays, players are given probably more time than they've ever been with under 23s. But time is is not your friend. Time is not on your side. And it's it's imperative that you that you learn quick, listen to the coaches, because you need when you leave school and come into the into the full time arena. You really need to develop very, very quickly and you know, if you want to be a, a first team player. And the third thing I would say is apply yourself correctly and give it everything you've got. Because what you don't want to do is have regrets. Um, we've all got regrets, but if you can come out of football, even at the age of 35 or even 19 or 21 or whatever age, and you've applied yourself correctly and you've given anything. I think at least you can hold your head up high and know that you give it your best shot. If I had the benefit of hindsight, this is from a goalkeeping perspective. So if there's any young goalkeepers out there that can maybe relate to the experiences I had, I think the biggest thing is don't be afraid afraid to talk about it. And then, you know, I think the relationship goalkeepers have with the goalkeeping coaches is quite unique compared to outfield players because of the time spent. And if there's one person that is going to understand you, then it, I would like to think it would be the goalkeeping coach. So talk, speak up. Don't 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 be afraid of the old stigma that is. If you you know if you're feeling scared of playing or if you're feeling feeling afraid of mistakes, um, you, you need to talk about that because the reality is now there is solutions to those problems, and that it, it can very well be the difference between a career being successful or ending. Can that be a difficult one in a in a football environment? Just with the, I suppose, yes, very much so. Just think about selection. That's all. How much say no, go a job with selection? It, it is a very difficult one. Um, but uh, but I think yeah, there's there's a point where coaches should be good enough now. So I, I'll I'll change. It. And we're kind of go off track here with this one. But Alex Ferguson got asked why he didn't give Eric Cantona a hard time when he kung fu kicked the fan. And he said he knew at that time the whole world was going to be coming down on him. And he says the one person he didn't need coming down on him was going to be his manager. He needed an arm around him. And I think, you know, you look at the way he managed, it's a bit of an extreme example, I suppose, but the purpose of the way he manages that situation, the way the managers of anybody should manage individuals, it should be very specific. 
Now, one need for one person is going to be very different to another. Um, and whether that person struggling mentally, physically, you know, if it's a physical ailment you have, there's no problems talking about it. But because it's a mental thought process problem, I don't see why it should be of an issue here. It's a big change in mindset from the from the football or a sporting environment that needs to change rather than kind of kiboshing it because the reality is it's massive. Yeah. You say that about the physical side, though, you do get players who well, pretend they're not injured, don't they? Because they, they really just want to be playing and again, they don't want to show a weakness. So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's a complicated one. <laughs> it's it's difficult, and I, I think you could, you know, we could probably talk about that for an hour in itself. Um, you know, there is pressures in elite sport to, to get your best players playing, and I can understand that. I can understand that process, but I think you know, for a young child, they've got they've got the benefit of time still. Um, it's not a week in week out requirement. Just at that point, like they still need to enjoy football. They still need to, you know, understand why they feel in the way they do and they still want to have that reason to get up on a, on a day to go and play rather than thinking I don't want to do this I'm scared of doing this I don't want to make a mistake I don't want to be shouted at that that should be a thing of the past as far as I'm concerned yeah no I totally agree um, well yeah as you say we could be talking about that for hours so well, we'll skip it you've got two more points <laughs> <laughs> we'll make it. We'll make it one more. Just do your exercises when the physio tells you, because you will get better. Just the process. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I like it. <laughs> <Fair enough. laughs> right then. <laughs> okay, since you you're not following the, the protocol here and not doing as I tell you. <laughs> I'll tell you what. I'll give you a follow the process. Do your exercises. Now there's two of them there. One is not so. <laughs> <laughs> I like it. Well, the first one is um, work hard as you can. Leave nothing to chance as regards to your application. You know, I still look back and say what could have been. And the what could have been is down to me to a certain degree. So always, if you don't make it, not everybody's going to make it. If you don't make it, make sure the finger's not pointing at you. It's somebody else's decision or somebody else's circumstance. It's not you. And I, I know myself, I, I, I didn't maximise my opportunity. I, I could have worked harder. I could have worked a lot harder. Um, so work hard. Um, number two, be honest. And being honest is being honest with yourself as regards to, suppose it comes back to that working hard thing, but also in situations, be honest with who you are as a person, be honest with who you are as a player, um, be honest with your teammates, be honest within the dressing room. And when you when you can do that, again, there's no, there's no ambiguity. If you're honest with yourself, you know exactly if you're good enough, you know exactly if you're not particularly good enough. And if you're not good enough for a certain level or a certain situation, that's not a bad thing. You just need to go and find somewhere where you can be if you want to carry on playing football. You know, you can, you're not only going to play centre forward for Blooming Real Madrid. It's not going to happen. But you might be centre forward for Crawley Town and have a great career and do something that many people can't. But be honest with yourself. And and I, I suppose this isn't this isn't an, an, an overbearing statement. Be, be confident. You know, be confident. And the confidence comes in many guys. The confidence can be, mean for me it means being happy. It means being confident in who you are, being confident in what you can be. And again, we'll, we'll probably come to this when, when he came out of football. It was weird. You know, I, I got to the stage where I used to be a footballer called Julian. And then towards the end, I was Julian who used to play football. And see, identity shifted hugely. Yeah, massively. So you talked there about your hard work, being honest with yourself and then being confident. I mean, the, obviously, the first one speaks for itself, but the... The last two, it can be quite difficult, can't it, as a like a young player to be honest with yourself because you don't really know yourself and sometimes what what you want at times. And yeah, sorry, just jumping you right there, and that's what I've said, and I bring you right back to me. You know, I probably that's what I'm talking about. If you can, you know, I suppose honesty and confidence, you could have you could have an overbearing one where you have a good support base. That's you know, try and find you know a good support base, whether it be a mentor or things you can bounce off, because that will probably feed all those three things that yeah. I'm just mentioning myself. So I suppose it's over. That could be one thing that could, that will feed all that. But yeah, you're right there. You don't necessarily have the devices as a young person. Yeah, and, some, and sometimes people, when it comes out of confidence, they just think black and white. I'm a confident footballer or, yeah, I'm a crap footballer, basically, and there's no sort of middle ground. So, mm -hmm. so yeah, you, you've, got to, you've got to be able to, like you say, find devices to, to increase that and, and get better at it. Oh, um, okay. Let's go back over what, what we've spoken about. So, um, I think, um, I think, in general, actually, and this would be a broad statement, sort of overarching everything that we've said, is you know, number one, 
if you if you can give yourself some time each week, sit down with a pen and a bit of paper, um, write psychosocial at the top of it or biopsychosocial if you're a little bit more into the complexity here and uh, and you know psychosocial plan at the top of the paper and start to uh, write down what you do and what you want to do from a psychosocial or biopsychosocial perspective. You know what's the What's the what's the psychosocial delivery here? Rather than seeing psychology in a corner or social in a corner, which some coaching models tend to do, and that's fine, okay. I would probably see it from the perspective of biopsychosocial driving and constantly interacting with the technical, tactical, and physical pieces. So start to consider what your plan is. From that plan, I think. Tip number two would be try to, when you write stuff down and you research stuff, try to figure out how to deliver in the language of the athlete, how to, if we want to scaffold this, as in to support our players' learning of this stuff, then we want to simplify it. So we want to introduce this stuff in a, in a language that players can grasp understand and potentially engage with and implement so watch your language have a plan number one number two you know mind your language keep it as simple as you possibly can but no simpler number three i'll tell you what dave we'll do something different <laughs> what, what would be your third thing from what you've listened what would you add to those two things i think i'll go for focusing on the process Cool. So, yeah, try to park the performance to, to one side, the score, the yeah. mistakes, that side of thing. And as you say, this relentlessness, um, things that you can control ultimately, that, that for me would be the third one. I love that. And, and, you know, it's interesting, Dave, that it's interesting you picked that because I think back because we got to know each other at England Golf. And I think back to the first year I was involved in a coach who uh, I – had, a, had and have a great relationship and an enormous amount of admiration for and he's a world class a world class coach he really a world leading coach in my opinion and one of the first comments he said to me was it was actually probably the only time in the three years I actually worked with England golf I actually respectfully disagreed with him he said oh Dan you know because I was kind of out trying to it was one of our first conversations and I was trying to grasp you know where he wanted me to come from and and what he he might want me to do and he said you know players are just fed up with hearing stick to the process stick to the process and you know maybe we've got to mix that message up and and the, the thing is, is I think we as sports psychologists continue to say it, not only because, you know, there's nothing true as such in, in sports psychology and possibly nothing particularly true in life or very little, but um, it, it's probably the most effective and efficient way to, to view um, the best approach in towards performance. And I just think that what I'm trying to say here is I just think, players are really by and large poor at focusing on the process especially under pressure because everything about pressure takes you away from the process but we can say this till we're blue in the face and players still need to constantly remind themselves of, of this there's a reason why in the back nine on a sunday of a major four times a year players are constant players in contention are constantly talking to themselves to keep with the process not least phil mickelson this year who won the uspga and on the seventh tee his brother who was caddying berated him a little bit sort of saying hey man if we're going to get if we're going to get a w here if we're going to win this we're going to get out of here with a win you've got to start swinging with commitment you've got to start committing to your swing committing to your shots that's a process right and that was phil going ah yeah bingo right and then he started to straighten up and then started to knock it past Brooks, right? That's how powerful that message can be. And I think that coaches are getting a bit scared of, or, or even don't know enough about, but a bit scared of, of process. And they're still, certainly in the industry, in the football industry, the soccer industry, they're still all too oriented towards outcome and performance. I rarely walk into an environment, a coaching environment in football, where there's a predominant um, 
uh, message around task and process and mastery over ego uh, outcome and performance factors out of a player's control. We're still not there yet. So I think you're spot on. I think it's, it's a message we need to continue to bore people with. For me, um, ask questions, um, be focused. Um, and when I say focused, be focused on your chosen sport, but not only that, be focused on yourself, your own well-being. Um, and um, don't be afraid to kind of make mistakes. You're not always going to get it right. You may sign for a club and think, this isn't right for me. Um, and it may be time for you to then look for another club and, and things like that. I mean, it, it, you can obviously ban that down to many different things in terms of kind of don't be afraid to make mistakes. But on the pitch, do what you need to do in terms of kind of portraying yourself in the best light possible. Everyone's got their own style of play. Obviously, managers will want you to play a certain way. Listen to your managers, but be authentic to yourself as well. Be that free spirit. Obviously, when you're playing football with your friends at school or in the playground, at the park or whatever, you're playing off the cuff. You're doing things that come naturally to you. Go and uh, kind of relay that on the pitch. Bring that kind of uh, raw emotion, those those things that you do naturally in terms of your ability onto the pitch as well. And you'll notice the difference. When you start being robotic and things, you're playing out of your, your comfort zone. You're not doing things that come naturally to you. That's when your kind of performance will dip. And I'm not saying you can't go out and, and learn new skills. I'm not saying you can't go out and learn how to head the ball or how to cross the ball correctly and things like that. You can learn those things. And when you're learning, you will naturally pick up your own best version of how to do those things because you're obviously going to learn in a way that, yes, the coach is telling you, but you're going to pick it up and understand it the best way you can based on your own personality and understanding. So, yeah, it's, I'd probably say those three things, but then, again, I could give you another 50. Um, it's, it's so hard to pinpoint it to three. Well, that was a fun episode to listen to. I really enjoyed it. I hope you did too. I'd like to say a big thank you to the guests who've played a big part in the creation of the episode. I wonder, you know, what was your favourite takeaway message? Feel free to let me know via email info at sport-excellence.co.uk or through one of the social media channels. Also, I'd be hugely grateful if you can spend 20 seconds, maybe 30 seconds of your time to give the podcast a positive rating. Five stars if you can with some favourable comments using iTunes. This action really helps us improve the podcast, reach more people and affect in a positive manner people's lives. Until next week, where we have another episode similar to this with a different theme, have a fantastic time. If you enjoyed this episode of the Demystifying Mental Toughness podcast with David Charlton, do check out my website, sport-excellence.co.uk and my online sports psychology resources. Sport-Excellence website has essential resources for anyone looking to build their own mental toughness or the mental toughness of their athletes or teams, or if you want to achieve peak performance more often or optimal functioning. The Sport Excellence website has everything you need to keep moving forward and thrive. So go on, head over to sport-excellence.co.uk to find out more.